Well, if you'd like to follow along in the message, let me have you turn to Acts chapter 13. Thank you. Because it is the first Lord's Day in December and we're observing the Lord's table this morning, um, I've tried to arrange, uh, as elders, we each take one of the consecutive Sundays, and I try to arrange um, on my particular month to bring this message to have one out of the book of Acts. And there certainly are uh, good examples of sermons that cover the gospel message in the book of Acts. So this morning I'm skipping over verses 4 through 12, which is the ministry during the first missionary journey in Cyprus. And I'm picking it up in verse 13. It is Paul's first sermon that's recorded for us anyway, um, and his longest, the longest of the messages in the book of Acts. Uh, But first, let's start beginning in verse 13 with the setting of this. Requires a little bit of explanation. Verse 13 in Acts 13. Now, Paul and his companions... And who are his companions? Barnabas and John Mark. Yes. They set sail from Paphos, the westernmost port on Cyprus. Thank you. Um, And they came to Perga in Pamphylia. We're going to hear about Perga. There's a a river opening to the Mediterranean Sea. And if you're looking at the whole Mediterranean Sea, we're way over on the right-hand side or the eastern side and up in the corner where we would call it Turkey today, but in the New Testament, they call it Asia. Okay, so we're up in that corner. And if you look at Cyprus, there's a river straight north of Paphos, coming out of the Mediterranean Sea and going all the way to Perga. They probably sailed the seven miles up that river and came to the city, probably straight in, in the region, or we might call it the the, uh, county, so to speak, of Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. Now we'll talk about this more when we get to the ministry in Cyprus. Uh, But for now, John probably left them in Perga. Something like this. He was unhappy with the whole journey. He was likely the, uh, the helper who got up and built the fires while uh, Paul and Barnabas were praying, having their morning time with the Lord. He probably made the meals. He probably packed. He probably was the general helper along the way. Whatever reason, when he gets to Perga, there are not just ships arriving there, there are ships leaving there. And he may have heard of one going to Caesarea because they had a, a, um, uh, a, a cargo for Jerusalem, that's where he wanted to go. Why did he want to go to Jerusalem? Because that's where his home was. Remember, back in chapter 12, when Peter left the prison, he went to the house of Mary where she and her son, John Mark, lived. So that's something like that is what happened. But Paul and Barnabas went on from Perga. And they came to Antioch in Pisidia, and on the Sabbath day they went to the synagogue and sat down. So they're there in the service. Many of you did this. You came in. You chatted. It was time to begin. You sat down. That's what they did. And after the reading from the law and from the prophets, notice they read from the prophets. You say, wasn't that a normal thing in a synagogue service? Yes, it was but it's going to come up later on in his message. Okay? 
After reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them. They probably recognize that Paul had on the uh, covering robe with the blue fringe on the bottom that marked him as a Pharisee. You're trained for ministering in a synagogue. It, it would be something we might do if we recognized uh, a preacher visiting that day, especially if it was someone we had heard of and wanted him to address the assembly. <clears throat> and so they said, brothers... This was Paul and Barnabas. If you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and mentioned with, uh, motioning with his hand, um, he said, Men, uh, interesting thing about the gospel of Acts. The word for people is anthropos. The word for women is only, females only, is gune. The word for men is used about 72, 73 times in the New Testament. 60 of them are in the book of Acts. And so he says, listen, you males, listen to me. He said, my, what a sexist time that was. <laughs> No, if you just read the Old Testament, where are the blessings passed from? From male to male. Why did Jewish families want to have males? Because the covenant blessings were passed through the males. It's not that the women were totally disregarded. It is that there was value, there was religious value. To the males. And so he says, Males of Israel, and you who fear God. You say, Well, didn't they all fear God? Yes, but a God fearer is someone who did not have to be there in a synagogue because they were not Jews. Okay? They were proselytes. He's going to call them devout ones later on in the chapter. So this is our setting. The people, Saul's name was changed to Paul back in verse 9, just a few verses before this. But notice here that Paul's name comes first, even though he was almost certainly much younger than Barnabas. So normally in a list, they would list the oldest gentleman first. But they don't do that here, probably because of Saul's training. Probably not because Barnabas was just Saul's age. In fact, Barnabas and John Mark aren't even mentioned specifically. You see what it says? The companions of Paul. Uh, the ones concerning Paul. Paul's the focus here. The ones that are with him. By the way, John Mark is Barnabas' cousin. Colossians 4.10 says that uh, John Mark is Barnabas' cousin. Once they arrive in Antioch of Pisidia, Antioch was a very common city name in the Roman Empire because of Antiochus, uh, a common emperor's name, kind of like Mount Pleasant or where I live, Beaumont, is the most popular town name in all of Canada. So it's very common. Antioch was. In the U.S., it's Greenville. There are Greenvilles in almost every state. So uh, people say, oh, you're from Greenville. Yeah, which one of the 48 is it that you're from? All right, so uh, we assume that there's a crowd. Uh, after, before we do that, we need to meet a group of men or remember them, called the rulers of the synagogue. Oftentimes, synagogues that were relatively small would only have one ruler. And uh, this one has rulers plural, probably a larger synagogue. And uh, we assume the crowd of the, the Jews included proselytes. Down in verse 43, they're called devout converts to Judaism. And uh, in, interested Gentiles. Gentiles were welcome to attend. They could not participate in a synagogue service. 
But if they were interested in the things of the God of Judaism, then they were allowed to be a part of the crowd. And Paul is invited to address the group. He stands motioned with his hand. Maybe they'd heard of this guy. He was supposed to be a Pharisee, but he had become a disciple of this Jesus person who was not widely accepted by the Jews. So maybe there's a lot of, oh, you know who this guy is? He's blah, 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 and he motions to them. You know, I'm going to begin to speak. Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The place, of course, they went from Paphos on Cyprus, probably a two-day journey to the uh, let me just look at the name of the river, uh, the western sh- or the southern shore, uh, excuse me, the western shore of Cyprus to the southern shore of Pamphylia, and uh, they arrived there in about two days. Uh, they soon, even though John Mark leaves, they're going to take care of themselves And uh, they make the 200-kilometer journey practically. It's 195 kilometers up to Antioch, to the synagogue. And it is the Sabbath day, what we would call Saturday. And uh, the time, probably the late spring of the year. This is when sailing started. Uh, The winter time was the stormy time of the year. So once the days became warm then uh, transport across the Mediterranean picked up and was very common. So that sets our time. Late spring, uh, about A.D. 47, and so the, the message of this salvation, that's what Paul's going to call his message to them. The word message is our term logos, the word about this salvation. Just like the Ten Commandments are called the Ten Words, uh, this is his message concerning salvation. And there are three parts to his message. The history of God's salvation in verses 17 through 22. The arrival of God's salvation in verses 23 to 37. And then just a few verses, 38 through 41, on the application of God's salvation. The history is very concise. It's interesting hearing a man who was trained as a Pharisee bring a message. Compared to Peter, for I know we have a couple of guys in here who are taking Greek. Yeah, Peter's like the guy who had enough Greek to make him dangerous. And it was the Holy Spirit who kept him from being dangerous. But right in the middle of a sentence, he just leaves it off and goes on to the next sentence. I mean, it's like like somebody saying, you know, uh, about every fourth or fifth word. That's what Peter does. But Paul, very, very precise. Here's the history of salvation. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers. This is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this is all covered in the book of Genesis. And made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm. He's talking when he speaks about God's uplifted arm. By the way, we call that an anthro, human Pomorphism. In other words, God is spirit. He doesn't really have an arm. He doesn't have any physical thing to lift up. But when we refer to God's eyes or ears or arm or hands, those are called accommodations to our understanding. His uplifted arm refers to the plagues that he brought on Egypt, the crossing of the Red Sea. It says, uh, with uplifted arm, he led them out of Egypt. And all this is covered in Exodus chapters 1 through 15. Then beginning in verse 18, and for about 40 years, notice what it says. 
He put up with them in the wilderness. I don't want for God to have to put up with me. I would like for him to enjoy when I seek his face and when I pray to him. Do you want to be the kind of person that has to be put up with? But this is what it says concerning them. He put up with them in the wilderness. That's Exodus 16 through Deuteronomy 34. And then in verse 19, after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. This is covered in the book of Joshua. Okay, so he's going right through the order of the books of Scripture. And then he says in verse 20, all this took about 450 years. Well, the stay in Egypt took 40 years. The wilderness wandering took, excuse me, the stay in Egypt took 400 years. And the wilderness wandering took 40 years. And the conquest of Canaan, about 10. He rounds that off. It takes about 450 years. And verse 20 continues, after that he gave them judges. So that takes us to the book of Judges. Yes, that was an easy one. Until Samuel the prophet, 1 Samuel chapter 8. What happens in 1 Samuel chapter 8? They ask for a king. And God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. Saul would have made a great political candidate for leadership in a country. Why? He was taller than everyone else and he was very handsome. Dumb as a post, but as long as you're handsome, you can be elected. It is the way we're influenced. He needs to have enough money to advertise that fact, but uh, it is a fact about politics, especially for the last 40, 50 years or so, where it has made a lot of difference, the appearance of the individual. Well, he warned them about having Paul as their king, but they said, no, we still want him. And when he had removed Saul, just like he put up with Israel, Saul did not work out. You know this. And so he removed him. Now, here's where he's been going all along. He raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said in Psalm 89.20, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. After this brief tracing from Abraham and his covenant all the way to David and his covenant, the history of God's salvation passes from David. He became king in 1010 B.C., so about the year 1000 when God made the covenant with him. He skips over the next thousand years and comes to verse 23 and to our second point, the arrival of God's salvation in 23 through 37. And uh, verse 23 says, Of this man's offspring, this man is David, of David's offspring God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, as he promised. You have to think at this point, it's ringing in Paul's ears. Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And he says, this is a Savior, Jesus, as he promised. He has brought the Savior that he promised. This promise, by the way, you probably have it in a Bible that has little reference numbers or letters, uh, is 2 Samuel chapter 7. That's when God gave to David his covenant. And uh, God tells him in verse 16 tells David through the prophet Nathan, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure or certain forever before me. 
Now, no human being can do that. Why not? We don't live forever in this body and in this life. We all die. And as we're going to read down below, David died. He did not live forever. This is referring to someone who is everlasting because he says in the next phrase in 2 Samuel 7, 16, your throne shall be established forever. So this is a reference to the Lord Jesus, and he's the one who was promised. And he's the one who came. He's the one Paul met. And he's the one now Paul is introducing to his congregation in the Antioch synagogue, or one of them. And though the time that elapsed between David and Jesus was 1,000 years, God always keeps his promise. If he said he would save you if you believed, and with all your heart you believed, he will save you. He will never break his word. People often ask after they pray to be saved, how do I really know? I mean, I did pray, and as much as I know, I believe. So how do I know I'm really saved? What did he say he would do? Not only did he save us, but he is still in the process of saving us. And in eternity, he will save us even from the presence of our sin. So the arrival was announced. Before his coming, this is verse 24, John the Baptist had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, say, what, what is a course? It was his forerunner ministry. My course will be done when I'm finished with what God appointed for me to do. Your course will be done when what God has appointed for you to do is finished. Okay? Usually the course runs until you die. So uh, when he finished his course or was finishing it, he said, notice the quote here. What do you suppose that I am? Do you think I am? He's referring to the office of Messiah. No. Who do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No. And then a quote from Matthew chapter 3. Notice John 1, Matthew chapter 3. But behold, after me one is coming. And the word one is capitalized because it's a reference to Jesus, the Son of God. After me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy even to untie. I am a servant to take off shoes and bathe feet. He showed us that in John 13. But I'm not even unworthy just to untie the sandal, much less take it off and wash the feet. John says. It's kind of interesting because in this message he's going to quote seven times, five of those references from the Old Testament and two of them from the New. And the thing that's interesting, the reason I pointed this out, is Matthew's not even going to be written for another 13 years after he preaches this message. And John's not going to be written for another 60 years or so, 50 to 60 so we can't be quoting from the books of John or Matthew. And perhaps John uh, the Baptist was in Jerusalem and Paul heard him who was also in Jerusalem. Or Paul was one of the Pharisees that was sent out there to find out who John the Baptist really is. And he heard him say these things. It's fascinating to think about how God works by mentioning John's baptism of repentance, Paul was underscoring as true what the other Pharisees refused to acknowledge. Remember Jesus said, was John's ministry of man or was he sent from heaven? 
And they refused to answer. But here's one of the Pharisees God saved, and he's making this a part of his sermon to a bunch of other Jews in this synagogue. But it does raise a question. Has everyone here, everyone here repented of all your sins? Do you know you're saved because you have repented and believed? Well, the arrival of salvation is misunderstood by the Jews. It was announced by John the Baptist, but it was misunderstood, ironically, by the ones to whom the message was sent. Verse 26, brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, those are all the descendants of Abraham who were Jews. By the way, do you know where the word Jews came from? When the Israelites went into exile in... uh, The northern kingdom in 722 B.C., the southern kingdom in by 586 B.C. The last to go into captivity were the the individuals from Judah. And uh, they shortened, instead of trying to call them Judahites, they just shortened it to Jews. That's where the term came from. And so... Uh, He is talking to sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God, all the non-Jews who were present, proselytes and non-proselytes, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. That's where the title of my message comes from, is the message of this salvation. He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. Isn't that ironic? I mean, he came to them. And in fact, during the ministry of the gospel, it says to the Jews first and also to the Greeks, but first to the Jews. He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. But as many as did receive him, to them and only to to them, he gave the right to be called the children of God. We are not God's children. And we have no benefits in this new covenant unless we have trusted in Christ for the forgiveness of sins. So the Jews rejected him. In fact, they even fulfilled prophecy in rejecting him. He says in verse 27, For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, and this is really hitting home with Paul, these are the men, the individuals he grew up with. These are his people. Those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers. Remember, he was 13 years old when he went from Tarsus to Jerusalem and studied at the feet of Gamaliel to become a Pharisee. And here he was, probably in his mid-30s now. He has all this training. And uh, he says, they made two mistakes. Uh, Those who live in Jerusalem and and their rulers made two mistakes because, number one, they did not recognize him. And you know, they did recognize him a little bit. (laughs) They say in chapter 12 that this man has performed many miracles we cannot deny. You know, you'd think somebody would raise their hand in the Sanhedrin. If he's performing miracles, doesn't that indicate something about who he is? No, they knew this and they said, This is just going to completely take over Jerusalem if we allow it to. So what should we do? We need to kill him. I mean, that's like Saul saying, I need to kill David because he's the one God has picked to be the next king. Right, so you're going to fight against God. You know, folks, that's a useless fight. Because one day everyone in this room will die and we will stand before him 
and he has the last word. It is vain for a human being to fight against God. But they did that. They did not recognize him. They did not understand the utterances of the ones they just read in this synagogue service. They didn't understand when they read the prophets what those things meant. They had their little ideas about the interpretations they wanted to embrace. But they did not believe the truth about those utterances. That this Messiah had to die and, and suffer for the sins of the Jews. So... He's just laying it out here. Two things. And by doing those two things, they fulfilled these prophecies by condemning Jesus. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. What are we going to do with this guy? Well, let's kill him. Yeah, well, you know, it seems to me there's kind of a commandment about not doing that. Oh, no, and these are the champions of the commandment, right? But when it serves their purpose, they will turn against those commandments. And when they had carried out all that was written of the Messiah, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. Boy, I'm glad that's over. Yikes, no, it was anything but over. Right? So, so after laying him in the tomb, we have one of those phrases in Scripture, one of those verses in the Word of God that starts out with this, but God. This is verse 30. It is the good news about Jesus' resurrection that Paul brings to them. And so Paul says, but God raised Jesus the Messiah from the dead. And for many days, 40 days, he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. We call them his disciples. And notice what he says at the beginning of verse 32. These disciples are now his witnesses to the people and we, Paul's including himself as a disciple. He is a follower of Jesus now. And this is one of those places where when you read, you wish you had your smart cam uh, smartphone so that you could turn and take a picture of the, the look on their faces when he says all of this. This guy's got the fringe. What's he talking like this for? Everybody that we've talked to says that Jesus is not the Messiah. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. Who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the gospel. The good news. And what is that good news? That what God promised to the fathers. This he has fulfilled to us their children. By raising Jesus. So that's the good news, the resurrection. Everything that Jesus preached, God is putting his stamp of approval on. And notice how he proves this. The father raising Jesus made it clear that Jesus is indeed his son. Verse 33. He, he raised Jesus as also it is written in the second Psalm, Psalm 2 verse 7, you are my son today. I have begotten you. I'm going to comment on all three of these quotes at one time, okay? So you say, what does that mean, that, that the Father begot Jesus? Okay, just park that thought, okay? Park the thought. I don't want you to be thinking about that as I read on, okay? Park that thought. And park the thought about the roast beef cooking at home, too. All right, and as, he, this is verse 34, and as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way 
In Isaiah 55, verse 3, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, verse 35, he says also in another psalm, Psalm 16 and verse 10, you will not let your holy one see corruption or the, the breaking down of the body in the grave. Okay? That's the tent. That's not you. That's just your tent. And thankfully, we leave the tent and we go to be with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So, so we're not there to watch this dissolution of the flesh. I am glad for that. So he says this, for David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, this is verse 36, he fell asleep, that is, he died, and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. By the way, let me just say, not everybody who dies falls asleep. In the New Testament, only Christians fall asleep. All others immediately appear in the torture of Hades. All right? Then verse 37, But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Paul's quote from Psalm 2-7 is not saying that the father had a wife and they had a baby and on this day the baby was born. We understand that that happens with human beings. This is not what happened with him. Uh, when he uses the phrase, today I have begotten you by raising him from the dead, Jesus Christ had fulfilled everything the Father wanted him to do. Now my father was a physician. He was a doctor. And we heard growing up, birthday after birthday, uh, it would be great if you decided to go into medicine. If you decided to follow me into uh, medicine, into medical school. And if, if that had happened and one of the brothers, the three of us, had gone to medical school and we had graduated from medical school, my father would be in the audience. And when we walked across the stage and got that diploma... He would walk up to us, give us the first hug he ever did give us, tell us he loved us, which he never did otherwise, and, and then say, today you have become my son. You are following in your father's footsteps. That's the way this expression is used. When he finished and gave up the ghost, and he said to his father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. When he died and was laid in the tomb, he had fulfilled every expectation of his father. And when the father honored that by raising him from the dead, he was proving that this was his son. In Isaiah 53, 55, rather, verse 3, God is promising that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, that he is the everlasting king, and therefore must be raised from the dead. He could not be corrupting in the grave and be everlasting. And then finally, when he quotes from Psalm 16, the interesting thing about this quote is that Peter makes the same Citation from Psalm 16, verse 10. Back in the Pentecost sermon in Acts chapter 2, in verse 24 through 27. And in verse 27, he says, You will not let your Holy One see corruption. Now, you, you don't have to read very far. You have to ask yourself, why does the Bible capitalize Holy one. Why does he capitalize any of the names of Jesus or any of the references to Jesus? Because they're references to Jesus and not references to David. He would never capitalize David as a 
holy one. But he does for Jesus. He does it because this refers to Jesus and not David. So after the history of God's salvation, point one, we've seen the arrival of God's salvation, point two, and that Jesus was coming. Uh, he was uh, God's salvation. There is salvation in no other name, Acts 4.12. And we saw that his arrival was introduced by John the Baptist, misunderstood by the Jews, but then vindicated by the Father, raising him from the dead. Now he's going to apply. And this is where we go back to the beginning. I mean, I hope you were paying attention when I was talking to the kids because we're all kids. All right? The explanation. This is the first part of his application. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers. And he's addressed them directly this way. Two other times. This is his third time. That through this man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. So the message of salvation has three parts. Part one, salvation comes through Jesus Christ. It comes by Jesus Christ. It does not come through Moses, through our trying our best to obey the Ten Commandments or the Mosaic Law. That's not where it comes from. You can even be an extreme Christian and try and follow all of the Old Testament Scriptures. And you will never be saved that way. By the way, neither is that the way to please the Lord. It does not come through another religious leader like Moses. It does not come through a church or any other religion. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. And no one can come to his Father, the only true God, except through him. That is the way of salvation. And I know we live in a time where people believe that there are many ways to God. That's just one of the many lies Satan has told people down through the history of mankind. There is only one way. And it is through Jesus. His death was our penalty and by his stripes we can be healed from our sins. So the, the first part of salvation, it comes through Christ. The second part of salvation, it consists in the forgiveness of sins. We'll say, you know, I'm just, I'm just not a real sinner. I just don't do much that's bad. Um, yeah, you do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. As a matter of fact, some of you are really, really bad. No, maybe some of us are really, really bad. Okay? Yeah, we are all sinful. Therefore, we are all sinners. Therefore, we all need forgiveness. In fact, the Ten, Commandment, Ten Commandments prove that we are sinners. I've had people say, well, you know, I'm not so bad. I said, well, look, the first commandment says you're not to have anything before the Lord uh, God. Is there anything in your life that's more important to you than God? Well, you know, they're going to dither on that one a little bit because they're not quite sure. They never have compared anything with God before. But then you say, well, look, have you ever taken the Lord's name in vain? You just swear by his name. You use an exclamation. And then they dither a little bit less because their brain is saying, oh, yes, you did this before you left home and came here. And... So, so, okay, have you, have, you, have you ever bowed down before an idol? No, I've never done that. You know, we used to do that many times a week. 
Because in going into the sacristy in the back of the church, you had to go either by Mary this way or by Joseph that way. And you did not just walk by them. You had to genuflect. Now, if you know what that means, you were raised Catholic. But you had to bow down. And they say, well, you know, those statues... That's not really idolatry. Those statues are just an aid to your devotion. Anytime you bow down before something. I had a a sister and brother-in-law who were in Japan for 18 years, and they were just appalled at the number of believers who came to visit them, and the first place they wanted to go was one of the Shinto temples. Why would you ever want to visit one of them? That's where the demons live. I mean, this is not culture. This is religion. This is people's idolatry. They put value in this kind of thing. When I first took my wife to a Catholic church, she had never been to a Catholic church. She was actually only my fiancé at the time. And she said, what are these people doing? I said, well, they've just been to confession, and they've been said, or they've been told that they have to go back to their seat and pray so many Hail Marys or Our Fathers, or if they did some really bad stuff, a whole um, rosary. And, uh, you know, I was going through all, I was so excited I could explain the whole thing to her, and I never even noticed that she was crying. For her to think that people actually thought that, that that was the way their sins could be forgiven by just rattling off a few prayers. Just like the Buddha, spin that little prayer thing. It means nothing. There's no suffering for all of those sins. And by the way, many of the worst sins have to do with twirling that thing around. I mean, this is an offense to the truth and to God. So yes, Psalm 53 tells us that all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And yet the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Psalm 51 tells us that at the moment of conception, conception, we are sinners. And there's some of you who are reluctant to discipline your children because you think, uh, you know, they're not that guilty. They're innocent. No, folks. We are born not only with the sin of Adam on our souls. We are born with the punishment of Adam on our souls. And it's, it's like I remember a, a teacher we had in a class one time saying, you know, that, that beautiful little child that you love to hold in your arms, That cute little pagan, that's what he is. That's what she is. If they aren't saved, they will be lost forever. When do we need to start evangelizing? I mean, you play music for them before they're even born. Wouldn't it be good to have someone preaching and just put the thing right on top of you? Listen to this. I don't know whether you're male or female, but I want you to pay attention to this. But God's forgiveness dismisses those sins, all of them, as far as the east is from the west in the, uh, in the depths of the deepest sea, until all he sees when he looks at us is the perfection of Jesus. It's all he sees. He does not see our sin. He sees that he has dismissed it. He has sent it away. The moment we believe in Christ. Part three of the salvation, we receive it by faith and by faith alone. Not by trying, not by doing. We come to Christ with genuine faith. But when we sin after we get saved, we feel like, I wish I could do something really hard. I wish I could kind of deserve the forgiveness. Why would you go back to before you were saved and do that? And yet we have this wicked, depraved thinking that somehow I have to pay for my sin. And if if I get ill, well, then I feel better because I'm somehow paying for my sin. No, that's an affront to the one who did save you from your sins. 
God's forgiveness frees us from all the things that our best effort obedience to the law of Moses could not free us from. What is that? From the guilt of sin, from the power of sin, from the eternal punishment of sin. Even when we get there, the sweetest words in Revelation, there is no more sin. There is no more curse. Do you know what that's going to be like? Uh, Randy Alcorn's book on heaven. He says, if you want to try and imagine what heaven is, think of what goes on where you live, the whole city or the whole town, and take away sin from all of that. I don't know how to do that. I don't even know how to think that way. That's what heaven is going to be like. But then he ends with a warning, verses 40 and 41. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets, Habakkuk 1.5 is what he's going to quote, Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. Do not fail to receive God's salvation. Do not fail to believe his words. I am not a very good preacher, but I am telling you from the word of God how you can be saved. And if your response to this is, I don't believe that religious stuff. I mean, that's not me. I'm not all that bad a person. I don't don't really need this. If you scoff at this and don't believe, you will be lost for all eternity. You will be. You say, well, it's like you're trying to talk me into it. I wish I could talk you into it. Paul wished he could talk Agrippa into it. Why should I not wish I could talk to someone who's not a king into getting saved? Yes. And so this morning, we remember the Lord's death in our place. And by partaking of a memorial to his flesh, which is broken for us, and by drinking a memorial to his blood, which was shed for us, we renew our dedication to him. We are grateful for that salvation. There is nothing in our lives. There is no possession worth a fraction of being saved. And that ought to be for us the most important thing. If our men will come forward, we will receive the tithes and offerings. I'm going to close this in prayer. Then you who have been appointed to distribute the elements are welcome to come. Father, thank you for your truth. And Lord, let there be no one in this audience, just as Paul wished there was no one in his audience, who would simply scoff at this truth and turn away from it. And I do pray, Lord, that for all of us who know you, that you would work in our hearts the kind of gratitude that puts every single thing on the altar, all family members, all husbands or wives, every single possession. We are better with nothing than to be without gratitude. And I pray that our gratitude would show today in that renewal by your grace of our determination to live for you out and out. No holes barred. In Jesus' name, amen.